Why are movies so dark these days? It's been five years since the Game of Thrones episode, The Long Night, propelled the subject of conspicuously dark or dim images into the mainstream discourse. Five years later, we're still awash in dim imagery. Why haven't we solved it yet? Who's to blame? Well, first, we need to define dark. What the heck is darkness? A digital image is made up of pixels, and each of these pixels has a luminance value that can be expressed as an IRE level. Zero is black, 50 is middle gray, 100 is white, which brings us to... Underexposure is often blamed as the root of the quote-unquote new darkness, supposedly infecting films everywhere. You know, cinematographers getting lazy on set and not renting enough lights. But is it? Well, it's a measurement of one thing. How much light is getting to your camera's sensor or film frame? It determines the information set that you have to push around. This frame, filmed at ISO 800 and underexposed by a couple of stops, need not result in a final image that is any darker than this image, which is overexposed by two stops. This is because once we've captured a decent data set, we're free to move it around in various directions. By simply pushing this sensor data brighter in post-production, and this sensor data darker, we end up with two images with perceptually equivalent brightness levels. Of course, as a byproduct of the underexposure, this image is significantly noisier than that image, but that's a totally different variable than lightness and darkness. Color grading, on the other hand, impacts perceived brightness significantly more than exposure in camera. So this same image, with a white point set to 100 IRE, or 70 IRE, or 30 IRE, produces three totally different perceptions of brightness. This image, though, speaking qualitatively, feels a bit forced, right? This is because you're looking at me now and you can tell it's a bright day outside, but the color grading is telling you otherwise. Um, that's a dissonance. And this is where we have to tackle lighting design. This image has been lit with about eight times the amount of light as that image, and yet it feels darker. This is because, except in extreme cases, the amount of physical lighting we have on a film set has almost nothing to do with how bright our final image looks on screen. It has much more to do with where you point the light, how much of the frame you are lighting with that light, and the contrast between various elements in the frame. And of course, when you add color correction to the mix, you can maximize or minimize that effect. This is a brightly exposed image that has been carefully curated so as to appear dark. So why are filmmakers having gathered the requisite data to do this, instead giving us images that look more like this? This is where things get less quantifiable, but I think it boils down primarily to two factors. First, because we can now. The digital toolkit, in particular the post-production toolkit, allows us far more flexibility in terms of rendering what darkness looks like on screen than we had previously. A joy. When Gordon Willis shot his famous dark scenes on 35mm film stock timed photochemically, he couldn't change his white point in post-production the same way that we can now. He had to create a sense of darkness mostly through lighting, and his margin of error was low. His quote-unquote dark scenes are full of well-exposed skin tones thrown into relief against large areas of negative space, Look on a mask of my boy. It's this contrast that creates a sense of darkness. Compare that to the work of Greg Fraser and Bradford Young and many others, and we can see that the white point of these scenes was not physically possible prior to digital intermediates. When a new toolkit is introduced, it's in the nature of forward-thinking artists to explore all of the new possibilities that said toolkit opens up. It's no surprise then that filmmakers are taking full advantage of these opportunities. But these tools do not make dim cinema inevitable. They just make it possible. This is where fashion comes in. Why do we wear the things we wear? And why will they look dated in six months time? This look in the year 2024 is trendy and has been for some time now. When a certain aesthetic tick becomes fashionable, artists who might not have otherwise embraced it find themselves looking towards it as a default state. Dim visuals are just like any other aesthetic mode apt for certain projects and processes, but not necessarily a good fit for others. It's not any one artistic gesture or trend or current, but the nature of herd mentality that can cause aesthetic issues when they do arise. Yeah. I'm the helicopter guy. Yeah. Whatever the case, these trends exist. Discussions tend to focus on the quote unquote darkness of the images themselves, but more often than not, the issues actually lie elsewhere. 
beginning with how these images are shown to audiences at home. Out of the box, most consumer televisions, phones, tablets, and monitors are calibrated to pop to show off just how bright and vivid the display can get. Intended to wow customers, this calibration is generally at odds with accurate image reproduction. Viewing environment plays a complementary role. Most televisions are situated in brightly lit rooms and therefore need to compete against both natural and artificial light. Filmmaker mode is no match for the sun. All content will look dim in this context, but content that has been specifically crafted to look dark in ideal viewing conditions might look downright illegible. I'm probably pretty hard to see now, right? Our content delivery systems compound these issues. Over the past decade, physical media has been displaced by streaming services, which have far lower data rates. Meanwhile, driven by marketing priorities, resolutions have quadrupled. A top-of-the-line 4K Netflix stream will feature, at most, 20% of the data per pixel of the average standard Blu-ray. This means that huge swaths of the data that comprise the image are in one way or another being removed for the sake of a smaller file and a higher, more marketable resolution. This aggressive compression wreaks havoc on dark areas, which the algorithms generally target because they're less visible. When a scene, or a film, exists entirely in those dark IRE levels between 0 and 20, phenomena like the widespread banding and artifacting noticed by many upon the broadcast of The Long Night occur. And so, we've got audiences and critics responding negatively to quote-unquote dim cinema, often blaming filmmakers and their tools in the process. Filmmakers, for their part, often see this dismissal as a conservative aesthetic impulse. The old ways were better, why don't we just go back to them? What both of these arguments miss is that the bulk of this issue lies in the rather broken systems connecting artistic intent with real-world exhibition, particularly at home. To take one example of many, a 4K or 8K signal yields, independent of other variables like compression, only marginal benefits over a 1080p signal. And yet consumers are being sold on these marginal benefits, often to their detriment. A crappy 8K signal might sound great to consumers who might not know any better, but a truly healthy 1080p signal will be superior in most cases. The resolution arms race isn't an isolated case in which marketing has trumped fidelity either. It applies to color encoding, display calibration, sound reproduction, motion smoothing, the list is endless. Audiences and filmmakers share a vital interest in a refocusing of marketing and production away from the latest branding of the moment and towards intuitive systems that deliver reliable images and sounds to non-specialists, as well as mutual understanding and education as to the mechanics of these systems and their best practices. Filmmakers should understand what they're getting into when they say they want it darker, just as audiences should understand what they're doing when they want quote-unquote more resolution. This, of course, is just the first step to restoring openness on the part of audiences to new and challenging aesthetic norms and a healthier cinematic landscape. The Fault, Dear Brutus, etc. This video is a companion piece to a much longer article I wrote for Filmmaker Magazine on the subject. There is a link in the description. 